Hello, and thank you for coming. My name is Matt Laven, uh, Matthew Laven. You can call me Matt. I am uh, going to be speaking today uh, about teaching and doing digital humanities with Jupyter Notebooks. And uh, on slide one here, I just have my affiliation, uh, my Twitter handle, at MJLaven80, and also my username on GitHub, which will uh, come up later. So I thought I would share that now if anybody wants to GitHub stalk me as well. Uh, Feel free to um, jump in if you have a question. This is the first time I'll be giving this particular talk. So I actually do uh, invite you to raise your hands as we go. We'll, there will be questions at the end as well. But uh, I think that'll be helpful if people have a point of confusion to just jump in. Uh, and if you are a little bit bashful about doing that, that's OK. Uh, feel free also to tweet a question to me, and I'll check that at the end, OK? Uh, that's totally fine. So. Uh, to begin, I just want to introduce myself a little bit. This is my first time here. As I said, my name is Matt Laven. My background is in literary studies and history of American publishing industry. And uh, I did a doctorate at University of Iowa and finished in 2012. And I became interested in digital humanities uh, in 2012 and did a postdoc the year after that at the Center for Digital Research in the Humanities at University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And uh, my current position, I'm director of the Digital Media Lab at the University of Pittsburgh that's in the English department. So it's kind of an interesting mixture of uh, coding and literary studies. I support four programs, literature, writing, composition, and film studies. So uh, I also teach digital courses. And I've only been really uh, seriously coding for about three or four years, mostly working in Python for that entire time. And uh, I really just uh, drank the Jupyter Notebooks Kool-Aid in just this past March. So I wanted to uh, thank uh, Matt Burton at University of Pittsburgh for convincing me to try it out. And uh, I'm going to talk really mostly about the way that I have used Jupyter Notebooks so far and what I think they represent and why I think you might be interested. So first off, uh, Maybe a little bit about you. You don't have to belong to one of these categories, but I just tried to anticipate who might be interested in this and why. And so I thought maybe some of you are programmers or developers who at some point have to explain or teach code to non-coders. Is that fair to say? Uh, and then uh, some of you might be Python beginners who are actually just trying to learn more code. And Jupyter Notebooks might represent a way of doing that. You might be a data scientist, a data munger, wrangler, et cetera, who wants to share results more effectively. Jupyter Notebooks can do that. Uh, you might just be a Python lover who's wondering what digital humanities is. Uh, I get that question a lot. What are the digital humanities? And finally, uh, although I didn't necessarily advertise this, you might just be someone who loves HP Lovecraft. And if you do, you are in for a treat. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about HP Lovecraft. Come on in. Uh, so here's my basic outline, which I will break uh, very soon. I'm going to talk a little bit about Jupyter Notebooks and what they are. I'm going to do as little of this as possible because it's pretty Googleable, And some of you probably already know this. I'll talk a little bit about the advantages of the technology, potential drawbacks and challenges that I see. So if you have solutions to those things, feel free to jump in. Um, a little bit about how we uh, might share Jupyter Notebooks. And many people are working on very interesting things. So I'm basically just going to talk about three things in that camp. And then most of what I'm going to talk about is how I have used Jupyter Notebooks for the digital humanities. So uh, that will be the bulk of my presentation. And then I'll, what I'll do here is uh, try to very deftly switch from this PowerPoint uh, presentation to an actual Jupyter Notebook context, and then switch back uh, so seamlessly that everyone is super impressed. Uh, and it seems like I'm uh, just really good at that sort of thing. And then uh, some just future goals, kind of outlining those. So OK, uh, some of you may know this, but uh, Jupyter Notebooks build themselves as an open source interactive data science and scientific computing across 40 programming languages. The website is jupyter.org. Uh, some of you probably have done something with IPython or IPython Notebooks, and th that's the, really the roots of this project. But uh, a group uh, working on this rebranded it as Jupyter Notebooks by taking uh, the name uh, Python, Julia, and R and kind of mushing those together, Jupyter. Right? Uh, so it's really cool. And you basically what you get is uh, a, a main dashboard uh, with control panels 
about these things called kernels and then these things called notebook files. And they use uh, a web browser as the graphic user interface and allow you to basically, you can run a notebook server from the command line, from terminal for me, I'm on a Mac. And then um, you open up this graphic user interface and you can actually just write Python in this context, but you get something that's a little bit more interactive and a little bit more graphical, right? So, uh, the advantages here and a little bit about how it works. But basically, you start, for the most part, by running it locally. Uh, it works with your kind of pip install, uh, things that I'm guessing most of you are used to if you use Python, which is, you know, pip install, Jupyter, uh, start up a virtual environment, and then uh, you can have a requirements.txt file in your virtual environment, and then you, you run this notebook server. And then uh, what you can do once you get into Jupyter is you can actually have these different cells where you would have either uh, straight Python code or uh, Markdown or uh, raw cells that actually just have like any, any kind of raw uh, text or uh, code. And then you can use these things called magic commands. Again, this is all pretty Googleable. But one thing that's really cool about Jupyter Notebooks is uh, a small uh, flag, and then you're writing bash instead of write bash, right? So for just a handful of things, if anybody has had this experience, uh, the Python way of doing it is a lot of work, and the bash way of doing it is one line of code, so you just switch back and forth between the two. So that's a very cool thing. And then these things are very easy to share via GitHub, and I'm going to show you that in, in a bit. And then uh, because you can do markdown and other types of things like that, um, there's a potential to mix code and uh, these narrative cells that actually have text that explain what you're doing. A lot of you are probably used to doing that with uh, your comments, but you can actually have a kind of like, you know, text block paragraph long, not just explaining the code, but explaining the narrative that brought you to that piece of script. So it's actually a hybrid narrative format. Uh, and I'll show you that example in just a second. But the general perks here, uh, if you're trying to introduce Python to a beginner, you really have to, uh, have to, it's better to be experienced if you're setting this up for someone, but to use a Jupyter Notebook, it's great for beginners in my experience. Uh, number two, if you're teaching code, uh, what you can do is set this all up ahead of time and eliminate, if you've ever run a workshop where you're trying to teach people Python, the first few things you're going to do is like install Python and then uh, probably uh, install, it's easy to install pip, but with some kind of sudo command or something like that, some higher level of higher access. Uh, and then you're going to start getting your pip installing your libraries, and then you're going to have you know, a handful of people in the room who have a PC, so it's going to be different. So there's all kinds of ways that uh, you might just use up you know, a half an hour of your workshop time doing all this stuff, and this is a way to skip all of that. And just start with a Jupyter Nova. Start with a Jupyter Nova. And uh, for me, the big thing here is the big thing here is for beginners using code. And I do a lot of this with my work. A lot of this with my work. Uh, the mindset is graphical, the mindset not is command line. And what you just can't get around it. You have to teach people to be thinking in a command line context and work with Python, right? And so I think that so uh, Jupyter notebooks are a great way to read and a great way to read into that, right? Just get people thinking about the interaction between the graphical interaction and the graphical and the command line. So. Some potential so drawbacks and challenges that you absolutely should be aware of if you're thinking of aware of running some stuff in Jupyter. Uh, running some stuff in Jupyter. Uh, there are some uh, issues with scale. Some issues these scale. Uh, these kernels uh, and these kernels uh, get overwhelmed and uh, get basically, and, uh, basically uh, freeze up and then need uh, to be rebooted. And then need so if you're running a server, for example, example that's a server, for example, that's an issue. Uh, uh, you, you, right now, it's it, harder right now, to, it's harder you have a to, notebook, it's basically you have everything in it, basically run it live, and you can run it live, right? everything can be changed right. by the user, be changed so if you want user. some sections, so if you want some immutable, immutable and frozen, and others, immutable and frozen, and others play with them, allow users to play probably not the best tool right now, the best tool right now for that type of work. I've seen a lot of chatter about the right to 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 uh, and then, uh, and then uh, I think this last thing I'll this something last challenge I encountered. You have a group of people. You have them all. You want them all. You have a book that they can look 
separate notebooks, notebooks that they can look at, notebooks that they can all use. Notebooks that they can you all have use. to decide what you have kind of decide what what kind context you want to create and for them. Right now, and right mixing now, shared mixing and private shared and private is something that's harder is to do. Something that's harder so I'll, tell you, I'll show you what I did. So I'll, tell you, I'll show you what I did. It right. is a challenge. It is a challenge. So, uh, for, so sharing uh, these things, for sharing I these things, this, but I already they're mentioned easy, this, but they're very too pushy to get up. Too pushy to get up. The app have a choice. The app have a basic knowledge. Knowledge will be able to do this. You will be able to do this. How to know how to create a repository. Create a repository. How to own a repository. How to how to how to synchronize. How to synchronize and commit add and all that kind of add and all that kind of basic stuff. And then you need to be familiar. And then you need to be familiar with a requirements of methodology. So that's something that's so that's something that is a beginner. If anybody is a beginner and haven't done anything with requirements of text file, pretty easy to learn. Pretty easy to learn how to do and wonderful thing. A wonderful thing to have under your belt. And if anybody is, and then you have these. And then you have these server Jupiter, server or Jupiter. And these are and these are things that would need to be installed on a web server and then could be run by a user, right? And you can do things. And you can do things like setting up open ID login, open ID login for these Jupiter. And a user would log in. A user would log in and have their own little instance, Jupiter instance. So that's pretty cool. So that's pretty cool, I think. So uh, the first, so time uh, the first I use these, time I uh, use these, any kind of, uh, with any kind of uh, sense uh, of other people, sense besides of me other people besides me and them needing to use them and look at them and get something that I works. Ran a, I ran a uh, digital humanities workshop at Carnegie Mellon University. It's like a week-long week seminar. It's like a week-long seminar for humanities graduate students with no digital humanities or coding experience. And, uh, and uh, some of them might have had some, but it was not a requirement in any way. So I came, so in, and I came in and gave a talk introducing literary studies and digital humanities. And then I led two afternoon workshops. And each had about six relatively small, right? so relatively but small, still, uh, but still uh, substantial, I think, for something like this. And then what I did is set up a Jupyter Notebook server for my workshop on uh, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing uh, virtual machine that I had been assigned. And then I also created uh, a backup option using this thing called mybinder.org. Uh, I ran my session using this, and then I also did support for the computational linguistics professor, Nare Han, to do the same architecture for her computational linguistics workshop. And then, uh, and then uh, basically took everything basically took everything and pushed it to GitHub. Uh, addresses uh, there, the address is there, and it's also pinned to my Twitter page at the very top. If you want to look at it, more than welcome to just go ahead and start looking at what Jupyter notebooks look like as I talk. So, uh, so uh, this is the part where I gracefully minimize uh, PowerPoint and hopefully, and hopefully get into get into the CMU workshop. The CMU workshop here. GitHub page here. And, uh, and uh, I think this is I think this zoom level. level. I'm going to zoom this just a little bit so, so that you can see it. This is a fairly typical GitHub repository with probably a lot more documentation in the readme than would be necessary for something that is in the software engineering world. But it has lots of instructions for the participants as well as for someone who wanted to actually run this exact workshop themselves or base a workshop on this kind of a workshop. So what we have here is uh, a partial introduction to digital literary studies. It has a workshop schedule with instructions for each item. I go through basically, and this lasted, I think it was about two hours with a little break in the middle. But what, what I did was I started off by giving the students these excerpts of literature. And I had them guess what year they thought they were published. And I thought that would be interesting because um, the work that I'm doing right now is on this uh, subject called chronostylometry, which is the computational analysis of the year of origin of a text using uh, computational techniques to kind of ascertain uh, what year was this probably from, but also like what happens when a text looks like it's from an era that it's not from. So, right? So, what happens when literature refuses to act its age was the name of a paper I gave. Uh, so I had students just go through these literary excerpts and guess based on their own intuition. And what I was trying to get at is that there are actually lots of contextual clues in just any average paragraph that would give you the impression probably within 50 years of when something probably was published, right? Unless it's doing a really good job of faking. But you'll get these contextual clues like references to technology or references to thing that, things that just feel very modern. And we actually have a pretty good intuition for that type of thing. Uh, 
I did 20 to 40 minutes of like absolute bare bones basic, uh, you know, here's what a variable is in Python, right? Just really getting people acquainted with the feeling of working in a Python environment. And then we launched the server and had them kind of, you know, create a string and print it, right? Uh, change that string to an integer, see what happens. Try dividing the string 5 by 10 and see what you get back, right? That type of stuff. I'm sure a lot of you had a moment in your own uh, training where you did exactly that. And what the Jupyter Notebook lets you do is it lets you fiddle and it lets you get feedback. And it has a really good mixture of, uh, you can do that in the regular interpreter if you just go into Python, right? But uh, what you get is a mixture of permanence and that mutability. It's really cool. And so uh, this is the Git, I'll just show you the difference here. This is the GitHub, right? Uh, sort of static version of this. And if you click on an IPYNB notebook, you're going to get a rendered version that's static, right? And I will show you that in a second. If you click on this link down at the bottom, for those of you following along, you create this, by the way, by going to mybinder.org, but then you just basically paste this badge in to the readme, which it's generated by the process of going to mybinder.org. And when you click that, it's gonna launch something that looks like this. And I'll just warn you, if you're interested in this, uh, doing it, it takes a while. What it is doing when you click that is it is taking your requirements.txt file and it is actually building a virtual machine that runs that Jupyter Notebook server around what you have created in your GitHub repository. So everything that you've asked for in terms of dependencies are going to be installed, right? Uh, and then you're gonna get something that looks like this and this is a Jupyter Notebook server and you'll notice immediately that you have a kind of uh, folder structure view here with uh, these notes that say running you also have this upload button, so that if you want to add files or materials into your Jupyter Notebook, you're actually gonna do that graphically if you want to. You can also do it non-graphically by, right, pushing those to, to GitHub. And you have this new button where you can actually launch a new Jupyter Notebook file. And uh, inside my repository, I have these notebooks that are already created. I have one that was for me, right? I have one that's called for snippets, it's just empty. And so when you go into one of these, and hopefully this will work because these do, yeah, these do expire, by the way. Uh, it's, it's launching a temporary server. So we get to see this in real time. But I just did this probably 20 minutes ago to get that set up, and it'll basically, uh, you know, expire within that period of time. And so I just refreshed that, and then this will launch a notebook. And notice right at the top that I have uh, import numpy as np, I have import matplotlib, and then I have this thing that is a magic, it's the only magic that I currently use. And it just says uh, matplotlib inline, which means that when I create a uh, uh, visualization using matplotlib, it's actually gonna print it into the notebook file instead of opening up like a PNG or something like that. And I think that is a really cool feature. Uh, and then just Python, right? We have our, uh, you know, print the type of MD text. It's Python 3, so we need our parentheses around print. Uh, we could write a function in here and reference it later. And then the way, what we do with these cells is you write Python, and then you hit the play button, and it executes, right? And we're getting warnings about Anaconda, and then we get our, uh, our class string. So basically, uh, it uh, creates this really cool interactive experience where a user can see the code you've already written and execute it bit by bit, and then also change it and have it actually change, right? And remember, I just launched this uh, just now, but if I just decide I don't wanna do type anymore, right? And this will take a second. Again, we have issues of scale. This might be gigantic, actually. It's the entire text of Moby Dick from Project Gutenberg, right? So there it is in a cell, and I could scroll through and actually look at this. Uh, so I think really what this comes down to uh, is for these introductory students, right, we have this uh, tremendous advantage of being able to interact in this context 
where you have, you know, everything you would want with Python, including all these uh, libraries that you would want to import, and you're able to actually produce that experience in a way that is partly graphical and partly command line, right? So uh, a, a huge aspect of what I'm interested in and what I do is this sort of buzzword called code literacy. And to me, this is a fantastic tool for that, right? Introducing people to and making them more familiar with elements of code literacy. So I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna talk about my next use case, which is a little different, but it has to do with HP Lovecraft. And basically, uh, I did a paper for a digital humanities conference about a month ago, and it was on this. So here's HP Lovecraft in a letter in which he says, when I was 10, I set to work to delete every modern word from my vocabulary, and to this end adopted an old Walker's Dictionary from 1804, which was for some time my sole authority. All the Queen Anne authors combined to form my literary diet. Uh, he also said, I am certainly a relic of the 18th century, both in prose and in verse. My taste in poetry is really defective, for I love nothing better than the resounding couplets of Dryden and Pope, et cetera, et cetera, right? He's for those of you who don't know, Lovecraft uh, wrote in the 1920s and mostly the 30s before he died. He's a modern author. He's thought to be kind of the, uh, the, the godfather of the horror genre before horror was called horror. And he's very much a modern uh, writer in that sense, writing for a lot of pulp magazines. But here he is saying, I really belong to the 18th century in these particular ways. So uh, what I thought is that these letters are a provocation or an invitation to look deeper. So I wanted to think about Lovecraft individually, but also to raise questions about horror itself, because horror so often, for those of you who like it, deals with ancient evils, these unwritten and folkloric histories, the return of these uh, repressed sins of the past. For those of you who have read Poe, it's all over Poe. Um, and then uh, the question being, is there a dominant set of terms for a particular era that Lovecraft and other Gothic authors uh, employed to create that feeling like we're horror, we're writing in the 20th century, but we're uh, trying to look and feel more like Frankenstein or Dracula, right? These, these 18th and 19th century documents. Um, so lots of people have actually written about this. There are many, many scholars who have done this. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about them here, but I just wanted people to know that I'm not making this up from scratch. I'm actually uh, continuing this tradition of thinking about like, what is the Gothic novel and how does it relate to horror? People are wondering that, right? Um, and so one thing digital humanists like to do, at least I like to do, is try to find a kind of quantitative edge to a humanities question. So my question was, is there an observable presence of archaic or classical or pre-1800 terms in Lovecraft and or the horror of Lovecraft's time period? And then is there an observable absence of neologism in these texts, words that came into the language more recently? Did they avoid those words on purpose? And can a machine learning approach be employed to better explore the relationship of time period to genre, right? So I wanted to get into this, this whole area of machine learning to see if, you know, can we train a model to uh, ascertain the date of a text and then run that model against Lovecraft to see if he can fool it. I thought that would be interesting. So uh, in terms of presence, I did this thing that's just basically the ratio of pre-1100 words divided by the 1100 to 1700 words. And then I also scanned the Walker's Dictionary and just did a ratio of the terms in the dictionary, right? Does this, do these authors like have a higher ratio of terms that are in that dictionary than other authors? Uh, kind of a weird thing that you wouldn't do in any other context, but Lovecraft said he looked at that dictionary, so I wanted to do the same. Uh, I also wanted to look to see if these neologisms were absent, so I needed a data set for that of neologisms. And then uh, for machine learning, I did supervised learning on, I basically took this ratio, this ratio, and these ratios, and I trained a supervised model with a bunch of different ways. And then uh, all in Python, all using uh, scikit-learn, for those of you who've done scikit-learn machine learning, very easy to use. And just wanted to see how this would perform, the next step being more sophisticated machine learning, but I haven't done that yet. Um, so what you get is things like this which is uh, over time, paradoxically, literature actually becomes more Germanic, 
uh, which is to say newer documents use older words with greater frequency. And the reason for that is because Germanic words are more common and everyday, and Latinate terms are more erudite and sophisticated, right? So as texts become more modern or modernist, uh, they actually start using older words, which is an interesting paradox. Uh, this is the same exact visualization using Oxford English Dictionary data instead of dictionary.com data. Uh, the next one uh, describes the actual data set of literature here, 950 works of fiction from 1750 to 1989. We have basic metadata and term frequency for these. Uh, they're tagged as detective gothic and science fiction. And the person uh, who did this is this uh, scholar named Ted Underwood. So I basically just grabbed his data set off of GitHub so that I could have kind of uh, comparison. And uh, this is basically Germanic Latinate ratios uh, by year and genre. So in red, we have the horror and Gothic. In blue, we have not horror and Gothic. And then this black dot right here is Lovecraft's Germanic Latinate ratio. And what we see here is that he's really not in any way a kind of outlier in terms of uh, Germanic Latinate ratios, right? He's actually fairly typical of his period. He doesn't look like, right, he could still be in the swarm anywhere down here, but he's not a kind of uh, middle of the 1800 pack. He'd be on the top end of that. Uh, this is Walker ratios for fiction. So how does this work? And you'll notice, by the way, this is smoothing. Uh, the Lovecraft dot is here. The kind of more modest smoothing is the Walker ratios in blue. And then the combined heavy, heavy smoothing is this gray line. And Lovecraft is right on the line. So he's basically as typical as you can get in terms of his Walker ratio. What, we were, what I was hoping you'd find is that Lovecraft's Walker ratio is super high, right? He, he's literally going through the dictionary and making sure every word is in there. That is not the case. He did not do that, as far as we can tell. Uh, however, uh, this is, uh, these are Walker ratios. So basically, this is the same thing, showing Lovecraft dead center of the mean. And as you can see, right, you do, this is basically, it's not quite normal distribution, but it's, closer to it, uh, and you know, nevertheless, Lovecraft is right at the mean. Uh, this one is the test of absence for neologism. And what we see here is uh, these post-1700 words, just as you would expect, right, the presence of them just crawls up and up and up as you reach 2000. That's exactly what you would hope would happen with these neologistic terms. But also, it's fairly noisy data. Right? These neologism percentages uh, are never quite zero because of like OCR errors and things like that, or just the data of these neologisms being wrong, a little bit wrong. But it does climb up in a way that like in, in sort of, as you aggregate all these neologisms, you get this uh, upward climb, which is what you would hope to get, right? That means you have some good data. Uh, this is the same thing except it splits the terms. So the blue line would be words that came into English between 1700 and 1750. The red would be 1750 to 1800, et cetera, et cetera. And then these dots are Lovecraft right here. They're hard to see, so my next uh, visualization will show you what they are. But basically, uh, Lovecraft has more 1700 to 1750 neologisms in his text than average. And he's in the sort of high end of that, right? but probably uh, within one uh, standard deviation of the mean. Uh, the second you go to 1750 to 1800, he drops. And then when you go to 1800 to 1850, he drops even more. And then when you go to 1850 to 1900, he drops even more. And then when you get to 1900 to 1950 neologisms, he is in the absolute bottom 10%. So uh, we have, not quite normal distribution here, but pretty close. And we have strong indications that Lovecraft was either uh, deliberately avoiding these neologisms or his style was just so uh, affected by his early training that he just tended to do that instinctively. 
So uh, then I did machine learning, and this is a supervised approach that I already outlined. And uh, what I ended up with was a, a Gaussian naive based classifier. And this is not good, right? Basically, I was able to train a model that can uh, guess the year of a text plus or minus 35 years with 74% accuracy. That's not good for a machine learning standard, right? You would want like a 90% 10 year or something like that if you were really doing this. But I was really interested in this because it still produces a set of outliers who don't fit, and I wanted to see if Lovecraft was one of them. So here's what I found, right? Uh, these inside the band are off within 35 years. Uh, the stars are correct date assigned. And then these reds are off by 35 or more years. And here's Lovecraft as one of the most marginal of that period. So using this more aggregated standard, he actually does come up as a, it, it places him as, um, you know, it thinks he's more like early 1800s, pre-1850, according to this particular model. So obviously that's not definitive, it's just something that gestures as like, uh, hey, I wonder if there's more we can look at here. But I thought it was interesting enough to share. And it's all basically related. Uh, again, another GitHub repository here called Horror Genre. This is very sloppy, I apologize. It's a work in progress. But I wanted to show it to you because it really, and I'm running this locally as well, right here. This is essentially the same thing. But what I was able to do is basically create these Jupyter notebooks that produce and save these visualizations. They uh, allow you to actually look right at my code and then see the result all in context. So if you're interested in, oh, well, why? I don't know if anybody noticed, but the neologism ratios we're dealing with in those texts are like 0 0.04. They're absolutely minuscule, right? Like 0.04% of the words in this text are neologisms. Uh, that's really low. Why is that the case? Well, it's because most authors of the 1900s, the absolute majority of their words are those either Germanic or Latinate words. They just, most authors, most people writing just don't use a lot of those more recent terms. They just don't. Uh, and uh, as you scroll down here, you can just kind of see like how I would produce a visualization uh, using a library like matplotlib or seashore, right? And so someone can actually go to GitHub, and this is, this is the live version, so you can change it and hit play and hit stop and all that kind of stuff. But if you go to the, uh, the GitHub version, you can look at something like this, which is that rendered version. And what this is, is it's a notebook called OED Normalize, and it basically has a narrative as well as code that actually explains how I retrieved that Oxford English Dictionary data for those neologisms, right? Going through, Oxford English Dictionary has a big database of terms and their year of origin into the, um, the uh, English language. And then uh, a lot of them are like, you know, the year would be 1805. And then for others it would be 180 question mark. And then for some it would be early old English tech, that would be like a text field. So that's very much kind of a, standard data wrangling problem, right? Like I have to decide what to do with the words early Old English and do I turn them all into integers or do I take all the integers and assign them to just categories or something like that? And so turning that into like really structured CSV style data, uh, I basically just wrote a narrative explaining the choices I made. And the thing is for students, for my colleagues, for anybody with a humanities background but even for data scientists, a huge aspect of this is I had to make choices. Some of them were good choices, some of them were questionable choices, but many of them were just judgment calls. And they changed the result. So rather than uh, do something arbitrary and try to hide that fact and just make my data look really clean, I kind of uh, ascribe to the ab absolute opposite philosophy, which is complete transparency about what I did and emphasizing the fluidity of that. So having a kind of open data philosophy, but also a data process philosophy, right? And I think a lot of people would agree with that as a general way of doing things. Uh, and so uh, this does that. I just wanted to uh, point out a couple of other things. I don't know if anybody noticed. But here I'm importing an SQLite database. You can do that right in your Jupyter Notebook, right? Pretty cool to be able to just jump into SQLite, which is super powerful, lightweight database engine, and just use that in your notebook, right? 
Uh, same thing with matplotlib, I find that to be really helpful. And I did all the machine learning in a different notebook, so all that scikit-learn is being integrated into a Jupyter context as well. Okay. Come back to this. Yes. for the machine learning models? Yeah. So basically what I did is I created a, an SQLite database that just has the variables for all 750 uh, novels in that set. And then uh, the Jupyter Notebook itself will divide that into a training set and a test set. And then you can actually retrain that model right in the Jupyter Notebook and then run and get the results. So it's all, the, the thing that's not happening in the Jupyter, Jupyter Notebook is that really heavy, like, going through each novel and running the, um, the actual ratio calculation, right? So going through novel by novel and taking the full term frequency table and getting a ratio, and, you know, it basically all it does is loops through all the words and checks to see if they're in the dictionary. Uh, that is something that I just ran without a Jupyter Notebook because it takes probably, to do all 750. I'm sure you could write a really uh, efficient version of this. You know, it takes all the term frequencies from a MySQL database that has like, I don't know, it's like 18 million rows of data. So that is probably like, it probably takes a couple of hours to run. Uh, you could probably write something that does that a lot faster. I, I did not use parallelization, for example, so that would speed it up. But I'm in a world where uh, kind of good enough code and waiting around is not really a problem. Right, uh, I know some of, if you're in software engineering, that's not okay, but for me, you know, uh, if I can just leave my computer running overnight and then go get dinner, I'm fine, I don't mind. So, uh, it's lazy, I know. Uh, but I, you know, it's all a question of what the return is for that kind of work. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so, I just wanted to uh, wrap up, actually. Um, just conclusions and future goals. Uh, so. There's something called Jupyter Hub with Docker Spawner. I don't know if anybody's ever used it. What it does is every user in your Jupyter uh, notebook, when they log in, it spawns a Docker uh, image. So instead of actually like writing to your, uh, your web server, it would create a Docker, uh, which solves a lot of problems if anybody's had that type of experience. So I haven't done that yet. If anybody has done it, I'd love to hear about how you got it going. Did you kind of work with problems uh, at all? Yes. Absolutely. So what I do to set up uh, Jupyter Hub is you basically, do, do people use like DigitalOcean uh, or something like that, some kind of, you know, virtual server? AWS. Yeah, AWS, same thing. So uh, if you, you're going to, you know, create uh, your Ubuntu uh, server environment, do a whole bunch of configuration, right? And then um, your Jupyter Hub user is actually writing data right to your hard drive. As, a, as, a, as an Ubuntu user, right? They're assigned an Ubuntu username. So there are any number of basic security measures to prevent that fr them from having access to like vital areas of that uh, server. But you still have to basically uh, pre-clear uh, those users to be allowed to even like write data at all. So even though you can go in there and sign up using GitHub, using an OpenID framework, you can log in using GitHub. Somebody has to just log into the back end and approve that user. Well, for issues of scale, you don't want to have to do that, right? You want that whole thing to just be running on its own. Uh, you know, open sign up or some kind of sign up credentialing or something like that. So I know there are other ways besides Docker Spawner to fix that problem, but I think Docker Spawner is one way to do that. Because once you're in that Docker instance, you're never touching the actual configuration or hard drive of, of Ubuntu. You're in that uh, completely containerized virtual space. Does that uh, help? Okay. So uh, I would like to do that. Um, there's a way to do this where you're actually, if you're working at scale, you're actually connecting to a cloud, uh, a database in the cloud like AWS. I haven't done that yet, but I'd like to. Uh, I would like to build a public collection of digital humanities Jupyter Notebooks so that people can just jump in there and do stuff. I think that would be really cool uh, and have that be relatively open. And then the last thing is I really want to get into this kind of JavaScript and jQuery integration because I think Jupyter Notebooks would be very cool if they had just basic 
design functionality, like uh, I would like to minimize this entire section of the Jupyter Notebook and go to the next part, right? I'm not interested in the background information. Give me a basic accordion, right? And then I'll, I'll get down to the next thing. Or, you know, a table of contents at the beginning would be kind of cool. Just stuff like that. If you could do that in, in uh, uh, jQuery, it would make it simpler. So that's the end of my actual prepared talk, and I believe we have time for questions. Uh, yes? Yes, yeah. I totally agree. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you can use maps.lib for a lot of that stuff, but a lot of you maybe just prefer to, sorry, it's a Python conference, but uh, maybe you prefer to use D3, right, for certain things. Or you just like the way they look better, or you want to write some CSS on the top of it, or whatever it is, so yes, exactly. But, but the, the other idea, you, you shared the import statement that did it, the, the SQLite. Yes. Yeah, any, any kind of like Python library that you have installed in your virtual environment would then be accessible by the Jupyter Notebook. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one big exception to that, does anybody use NLTK uh, for natural language processing? So you know how you have to like download the data and it gets sort stored to a folder for like these big data sets and corpora that are in there? That presents a challenge when you're using MyBinder because you put NLTK into the requirements file, so it automatically installs NLTK, but it does not automatically install the data. So what you have to do is create a local copy of that data uh, in your GitHub repository. And the way I did that was just with a pickle, but you could also just like have a data folder, as long as it has the same name as the data folder that the NLTK data is in. Um, so there are ways around it, but it is a complication, yeah. You ever deal with uh I believe so, I'm not 100% sure, yeah. but if I'm understanding you correctly, I think it's, it's trivial. I think it's very straightforward. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I was wondering where the file would go yeah. if you're working on a remote server. Totally, yeah, uh, it would be set up with just a basic folder structure, and what you can do is when you start the service from the command line, you just specify where the folder, where the notebook uh, uh, is, and if you were to say upload, right, any file, it doesn't matter if uh, Jupyter can even understand it. You could, I could upload my PowerPoint presentation to that folder using that upload button, and it would then be on the server in that folder. So again, that's the problem with uh, potentially security you risks. Can do that from right within the Jupyter notebook. Exactly. Right there. Yep. Any other questions? So Jupyter Hub, uh, I've only, uh, it's, it doesn't work like GitHub. Jupyter Hub is something that you install yourself and it creates that user framework where people can log in. And if you have set up Jupyter Hub on your server, it runs exactly like a Jupyter Notebook locally. So you could go ahead and take a GitHub repository and clone it into your Jupyter Hub context and it would run exactly the same, as long as the dependencies are all installed. Right, that's the key. So you really do need someone watching that server and, uh, you know, creating uh, my colleague Nare, if she needs uh, pandas, and I haven't uh, pip installed it into that virtual environment, when she hits import pandas, it's gonna come back with an error, right? You can't actually pip install from inside of the Jupyter context. You have to do that separately. Couldn't you fire up the, the magic bash shell? Maybe, <laughs> yeah. I haven't actually done that, but for all I know, that totally would work. Uh, I'm just checking to see if anybody tweeted a question, but they didn't, so yeah, go ahead. Uh, how extensively can you modify the appearance? So for example, if I wanted to show a notebook to someone who is in Spark and just needed some kind of code, could I, you know, make that be hidden for some versions of it, or something like that? So this is not something that I have done. My colleague, I was talking to him about this uh, just about a week ago, because I wanted to do that. And these things are built on top of, I believe, us a, uh, 
like something sort of like uh, if you're using Flask and like Jenga, you, Jenga, you have these like decorator decorated templates. Uh, Jupyter, I believe, is built on something like that. The problem is that if you change the template, it's going to change it for every notebook across the entire uh, kernel. And so doing that where it only changed one or something, I believe there is a project where people are trying to create something exactly like that where they're uh, separate. But I don't know what it is. So if you want to tweet me that question, I'll ask my colleague. Yes. So that's a, a default kind of thing. I mean, somebody who has been sharing this could insert it there. Yeah, I think that's right. If, if that was your question, I didn't, probably didn't understand your question, but yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go with that. Cool. Yes. Did you have experience with multiple collaborators working on the same workbook and maybe you screwed it up or did something I'm so glad you asked that because uh, I was supposed to mention that and I forgot. But basically, if you have multiple collaborators working on one notebook on your server, you're going to have conflicts and it's going to be a problem. So what we did for the workshop was we did let everybody share a space, but we just uh, very uh, carefully explained to them not to do that. And so we had everybody create their own IPYMB file that was just named after their name. And so then we avoided that problem. But that is exactly one of those problems of, you know, if you have Jupyter Hub, you're all separate, so you can't accidentally create conflicts. But then you can't have that shared code space unless you put it on GitHub or somewhere else. So again, it's this whole thing of like, it would be really nice if you had like notebook files that only one person can get into, but then a shared folder that everybody can see. So if someone is working on that and I don't know, you know, I'm not claiming to know everything. There are many, many things I don't know. And this is one of them. Uh, if, you, if you do happen to know that, uh, you know, feel free to tweet or uh, talk to me. Other questions? We're fine on time, right? Like 10 minutes, so. Or comments? <laughs> so, yes. I did the risk of doing a statement in response to questions, because there is no question in that. Case. That's fine. <laughs> um, sorry, I hate that, but um, there's an author named Mary Robinette Powell, and she writes HMC-style novels. Mm. Yeah. So that's one of the ways. And I was just looking at that and you can be non-centered. Like, she's like, dictionaries are crap because there are lots of words in there that nobody else uses. Yeah. So and also they're not, like, you would think a dictionary from 1800 would be a pretty good proxy for the year 1800, and it's not because people who write dictionaries, especially back then, that was an ideological document. They were imposing which words you should use. So they were actually very mistrustful of new words. Yes, go ahead. I don't recall off the top of my head, but I do have a full list of all of that somewhere if you're interested. Yeah. Uh, if, okay. And you're more than welcome to email me if you want to get, or even dig into the data on the GitHub repository. Yeah. Uh, and one of your, when you had the comparison of the Latin names with the Germanic, right before Lovecraft, there was kind of this T. Yeah. What year was that? Yeah, no, yeah. Well, uh, this is the cool thing about, I think, using something like Jupyter Notebooks because I think it makes the content more accessible as well. And to me, so there are a couple of like big interventions in the history of the, uh, the novel and things like that. But I would really hesitate to say that it was, anything was caused by something, right? But there are these like, exactly. And so there are these like upticks in Germanic, for example. And one of the, big interventions that people talk about is uh, the early intervention would be like uh, The Spectator, this magazine called The Spectator, and Addison and Steele, who really like emblematized, if not led, a movement toward a more commoner type of language that like not absolute poor, but maybe middle class people would favor. So that would be moving away from the Latinate. By the way, uh, Austin and others of her period would be heavily Latinate, right? That would be kind of the distinguishing feature of that. And then the next big intervention, sometime in the late 1800s, has to do with uh, probably the periodical marketplace, 
probably the rise of like uh, what we think of as like the contemporary popular fiction movement. And then uh, novels having much more dialogue. Once you have more dialogue, you have more Germanic terms. So that's a, a huge implication there. Uh, and I think it's fascinating to see that just absolutely explode in probably the 1870s or 1880s with what's called uh, literary realism. And then the other thing I wanted to add about uh, this approach of your friend who's an author who's trying to write Regency. No, she's not my friend. Oh, just. <laughs> I was a little bit of two to my friend. Sorry. Well, you shouldn't have corrected me. <laughs> we could have just created the rumor that she's your friend. Uh, no, um, the, uh, this method of sort of matching uh, a dictionary of terms, which I'm fascinated by, it would do a really good job of fooling a computer in one way. But if you were, say, doing a term frequency approach, it would not fool the computer in that way, right? So for example, just your ratio uh, of, say, like your high frequency function words, the, of, and those types of things, uh, that's what we call latent style. So no, almost no matter how hard you try, you're going to uh, have those sort of term frequencies that betray either your time period or your genre, or most often just your authorial identity. Right, which is a, a field that I've done a fair amount of work in, authorship attribution. But I find it very fascinating because what we do is we have these very deliberate ways we mask our style or try to pretend to be somebody else, and then the computer can measure something else that's very hard to control. So I think that's an interesting interplay. Yes? So right now, term frequency is by far the most dominant because it's, um, you know, it's the most resilient against OCR errors, for example. And also, there are copyright issues. So you can actually put on GitHub all these novels term frequency tables, but you can't necessarily put all the novels in word order. But the competing model might be like a Markov model, uh, term order, some kind of a deep learning with that. Uh, I haven't done it, but I have heard other people doing it. Um, and then, of course, you could take n-gram features. But my colleague, Ted, I corresponded with him about this. And actually, I was able to send him the GitHub repository with the Jupyter Notebooks to collaborate, right, and get his feedback, which I think is awesome. But one thing he mentioned to me, for anybody who does machine learning, is that, like, usually n-grams, you know, bigrams or trigrams, they don't actually work as well as single tokens because there just aren't as many repeats across the documents. So apparently that just in, like typically does not work as well. Uh, but those are, and then, okay, so anybody who does machine learning knows you have these vector, uh, everything is just vectors, right? So you could do that with like uh, the fonts. You know, you could train a model on, on typefaces. I don't know anybody has done it, but you could in theory. That would be kind of interesting, yes. Uh, I don't know. I don't think so, but it sounds awesome. I think that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. What do you What do you guys think the hypothesis there would be? I would say a translator inevitably echoes the language of their time without even realizing it. That's That's my hypothesis. Yes. Yeah. Well, right, just like interpretation. So I'm out of time. Uh, if, there's, if there's one last comment, we can get it in, but go ahead. I was just wondering, what does a, what does a git diff look like if you change an iPython notebook and then upload it to repo? Is, oh, yeah. Is it a disaster or can you see it? Online? It's actually, a, it's a JSON tree. Okay. Yeah, so basically the entire iPython uh, notebook is just a JSON file that the, you know, the, uh, the difference would just look like if you changed any JSON. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>